Hi, friends. Are you ready to start another book? I know I am. So let's get on with it. We're going to read The City of Ember. I am so excited about this. This is one in a series of books. So if you end up liking this book and can't get enough, know that we can move on to the very next book in the series. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We haven't even started reading this book. I love this book because it is a dystopian story. A dystopian story is something like The Hunger Games, where it takes place in the not-so-distant future. Um, things have gone really badly, generally because of the government. Um, and people are suffering and having to fight for what is right or what they believe in or fighting against the powers that be. This is, this is similar. This is also dystopian. You'll notice that it seems like it's taking place in current times, but then there will be hints and clues that lead you to believe perhaps that it's taking place um, in the future a bit. So without further ado, we should probably get on with it. We're going to start with the very first chapter, and it's not really even listed as a chapter. It's called The Instructions. Before we do it, though, I'd like to bring your attention to the table of contents, always found at the beginning of a book that is going to help you determine where we are in the story. So you'll see we're going to start on page one with the instructions. We're then going to read chapter one today. The next page you see is a city map, map of the city of Ember. This is going to come in very handy. Um, I'll refer to it several times in the reading of this book because our two main characters, Lena and Dune, will be all over the place in this small city. You'll want to know where they are. So we'll use that a lot. But now we're going to start on page one, the instructions. Ooh, do you see my little flashlight? All right. The instructions. When the city of Ember was just built and not yet inhabited, the chief builder and the assistant builder, both of them weary, sat down to speak of the future. They must not leave the city for at least 200 years, said the chief builder, or perhaps 220. Well, is that long enough? asked his assistant. Well, it should be. We can't know for sure. And when the time comes, asked the assistant, how will they know what to do? We'll provide them with instructions, of course, the chief builder replied. But who will keep the instructions? Who can we trust to keep them safe and secret all that time? The mayor of the city will keep the instructions, said the chief builder. We'll put them in a box with a timed lock set to open on the proper date. And will we tell the mayor what's in the box? The assistant asked. No, just that it's information they won't need and must not see until the box opens on its own accord. So the first mayor will pay it past the box to the next mayor and that one to the next and so on down through the years, all of them keeping it secret all the time? What else can we do? Asked the chief builder. Nothing about this endeavor is certain. There may be no one left in the city by then or no safe place left for them to come back to. So the first mayor of Ember was given the box to guard it carefully and solemnly sworn to secrecy. When she grew old and her time as mayor was up, she explained about the box to her successor, the person who came after her, who also kept the secret carefully as did the next mayor. Things went as planned for many years, but the seventh mayor of Ember was less honorable than the ones who had come before him and more desperate. He was ill. He had the coughing sickness that was common in the city then, and he thought that the box might hold a secret that would save his life. He took it from the hiding place in the basement of the gathering hall and brought it home with him where he attacked it with a hammer but his strength was failing by then. All he managed to do was dent the lid a little. 
and before he could return the box to its official hiding place or tell his successor about it, he died. The box ended up at the back of a closet, shoved behind some old bags and bundles, and there it sat, unnoticed, year after year, until its time arrived, and the lock quietly clicked open. Chapter 1. Assignment Day In the city of Ember, the sky was always dark. The only light came from great flood lamps mounted on the buildings and at the tops of poles in the middle of larger squares. When the lights were on, they cast a yellowish glow over the streets. People walking by threw long shadows that shortened and then stretched out again. When the lights were off, as they were between nine at night and six in the morning, the city was so dark that people might as well have been wearing blindfolds. Sometimes darkness fell in the middle of the day. The city of Ember was old, and everything in it, including the power lines, were in need of repair. So now and then, the lights would flicker and go off. These were terrible moments for the people of Ember. As they came to a halt in the middle of the street or stood stock still in their houses, afraid to move in the utter blackness, they were reminded of something they preferred not to think about, that someday the lights of the city might go out and never come back on. But most of the time, life proceeded as it always had. Grown people did their work, and younger people, until they reached the age of 12, went to school. On the last day of their final year, which was called Assignment Day, they were given jobs to do. So I want to remind you of something. In the city of Ember, you only went to school until you were 12. At the age 12, you were assigned a job, a job that you would keep for possibly your lifetime. The graduating students occupied room eight of the Ember School. On assignment day of the year 241, this classroom, usually noisy first thing in the morning, was completely silent. All 24 students sat upright and still at the desk that they had grown too big for. They were waiting. The desks were arranged in rows of four, I'm sorry, four rows of six, one behind the other. In the last row sat a slender girl named Lena Mayfleet. She was winding a strand of her long, dark hair around her finger, winding and unwinding it again. Sometimes she plucked at a thread on her ragged cape or bent over to pull on her socks, which were loose and tended to slide down around her ankles. One of her feet tapped the floor softly. In the second row was a boy named Dune Harrow. He sat with his shoulders hunched, his eyes squeezed shut in concentration, and his hands clasped tightly together. His hair looked rumpled as if he hadn't combed it in a while. He had dark, thick eyebrows, which made him look serious at the best of times, and when he was anxious or angry, came together to form a straight line across his forehead. His brown corduroy jacket was so old that its ridges had flattened out. Both the girl and the boy were making urgent wishes. Dune's wish was very specific. He repeated it over and over again, his lips moving slightly as if he could make it come true by saying it a thousand times. Lena was making her wish in pictures rather than in words. In her mind's eye, she saw herself running through the streets of the city in her red jacket. She made this picture as bright and as real as she could. Lena looked up and gazed around the schoolroom. She said a silent goodbye to everything that had been familiar for so long. Goodbye to the map of the city of Ember and its scarred wooden frame and the, cabinet, and the cabinet whose shelves held the book of numbers, the book of letters, and the book of the city of Ember. Goodbye to the cabinet drawers labeled new paper and old paper. Goodbye to the three electric lights in the ceiling that always, no matter where you sat, seemed to cast a shadow of your head over the page you were writing on. And... Goodbye to their teacher, Miss Thorne, who had finished her last day of school speech, wishing them luck in their lives that they were now about to begin. Now, having run out of things to say, she was sitting at her desk in her frayed shawl, clap with her frayed shawl clasped around her shoulders. 
and still the mayor, the guest of honor, had not arrived. Someone's foot scraped back and forth on the floor. Miss Thorne sighed. Then the door rattled open and the mayor walked in. He looked annoyed as if they were the ones who were late. Oh, welcome, Mayor Cole, said Miss Thorne. She held out her hand to him. The mayor made his mouth into a smile. Miss Thorne, he said, enfolding her hand. Greetings, another year. The mayor was a vast, heavy man, so big in the middle that his arms looked small and dangling. In one hand, he held a little cloth bag. He lumbered to the front of the room and faced the students. His gray, drooping face appeared to be made of something stiffer than ordinary skin. It rarely moved except for making the small smile or making the smile that was on it now. Young people of the highest class, the mayor began. He stopped and scanned the room for several moments. His eyes seemed to look out from far back inside of his head. He nodded slowly. Assignment day now, isn't it? Yes. First we get our education. Then we serve our city. Again, his eyes moved back and forth along the row of students, and again he nodded as if someone had confirmed what he had said. He put the little bag on Mrs. Thorne's desk and rested his hand on it. What will that service be, eh? Perhaps you're wondering. He did his smile again, and his heavy cheeks folded like drapes. What a great simile. Lena's hands were cold. She wrapped her cape around her and pressed her hands between her knees. Oh, please hurry, Mr. Mayor, she said silently. Please just, let, please just let us choose and get it over with. Dune, in his mind, was saying the same thing, only he didn't say please. Something to remember the mayor said, holding up one finger. Job you draw today is for three years, then evaluation. Are you good at your job? Fine, you may keep it. Are you unsatisfactory? Is there a greater need somewhere else? You will be reassigned. It is extremely important, he said, jabbing his finger at the class, for all work of ember to be done to be properly done. He picked up the bag and pulled open the drawstring. So, let us begin. Simple procedure. Come up, one at a time. Reach into the bag. Take one slip of paper. Read it aloud. He smiled and nodded. The flesh under his chin bulged in and out. Who cares to be first? No one moved. Lena stared down at the top of her desk. There was a long silence. Then Lizzie Bisco, one of Lena's best friends, sprang to her feet. I would like to be first, she said in her breathless high voice. Good, walk forward. Lizzie went to stand before the mayor. Because of her orange hair, she looked like a bright spark next to him. Now choose. The mayor held out the bag with one hand and put the other hand behind his back as if to show that he would not interfere. Lizzie reached into the, ba into the bag and withdrew a tightly folded square of paper. She unfolded it carefully. Lena couldn't see the look on Lizzie's face, but she could hear the disappointment in her voice as she read it aloud. Supply Depot Clerk. Very good, said the mayor. It's a vital job. Lizzie trudged back to her desk. Lena smiled at her, but Lizzie made a sour face. Supply Depot clerk wasn't a bad job, but it was a dull one. The Supply Depot, the supply depot clerk sat behind a long counter, took orders from the storekeepers of Ember, and sent the carriers down to bring up what was wanted from the vast network of storerooms beneath Ember's streets. The storerooms held supplies of every kind. Canned food, clothes, furniture, blankets, light bulbs, medicine, pots and pans, reams of paper, soap, more light bulbs. Everything the people in Ember could possibly need. The clerks sat at their ledger books all day recording the orders that came in and the goods that went out. Lizzie didn't like to sit still. She would have been better suited to do something else, Lena thought. 
Messenger, maybe. The job Lena wanted for herself. Messengers ran through the city all day, going everywhere and seeing everything. Next, said the mayor. This time, two people stood up at once, Orly Gordon and Chet Noam. Orly quickly sat down again, and Chet approached the mayor. Choose, young man, the mayor said. Chet chose. He unfolded his scrap of paper. Electrician's helper, he read and his wide face broke into a smile. Lena heard someone take a quick breath. <gasps> she looked over to see Dune's pre Dune pressing a hand against his mouth. <gasps> you never knew each year exactly which jobs would be offered. Some years there were several good jobs like greenhouse helper, timekeeper's assistant, or messenger. No, no bad jobs at all. Other years, jobs like pipeworks laborer trash sifter and mold scraper were mixed in. But there would always be at least one or two jobs for electrician's helper. Fixing the electricity was the most important job in Ember, and more people worked at it than anything else. Orly Gordon was next. She got the job of building repair assistant, which was a good job for Orly. She was a strong girl and liked hard work. Vindy Chance was made greenhouse helper. She gave Lena a big grin as she went back to her seat. She'll get to work with Clary, Lena thought. Lucky. So far, no one had picked a really bad job. Perhaps this time there would be no bad jobs at all. The idea gave her courage. Besides, she had reached the point where the suspense was giving her a stomachache. So as Vindy sat down, even before the mayor could say next, she, she stood up and stepped forward. The little bag was made of faded green material, gathered at the top with black string. Lena hesitated a moment and then put her hand inside and fingered the bits of paper. Feeling as if she were stepping off of a high building, <gasps> she picked one. She unfolded it. The words were written in black ink in small, careful printing. Pipe works, laborer, they said. She stared at them. Out loud, please, the mayor said. Pipeworks, laborer, Lena said in a choked whisper. Louder, said the mayor. Pipeworks, laborer, Lena said again, her voice loud and cracked. There was a sigh of sympathy from her class. Keeping her eyes on the floor, Lena went back to her desk and sat down. Pipeworks laborers worked below the storerooms in the deep labyrinth of tunnels that contained embers, water, and sewer pipes. They spent their days stopping leaks and replacing pipe joints. It was wet, cold work, and it could even be dangerous. A swift underground river ran through the pipeworks, and every now and then someone fell into it and was lost. People were lost occasionally in the tunnels, too, if they strayed too far. Lena stared miserably down at the letter B someone had scratched into her desktop long ago. Almost anything would have been better than Pipeworks Laborer. Greenhouse Helper had been her second choice. She imagined with longing the warm air and earthy smell of the greenhouse where she could have worked with Clary, all, um, the greenhouse manager, someone she had known all of her life. She would have been content as a doctor's assistant, too, binding up cuts and bones. Gosh, even street sweeper or carpooler would have been better. At least she could have stayed above ground with space and people around her. She thought going down into pipeworks must be like being buried alive. One by one, the other students chose their job. None of them got such wretched jobs as hers. Finally, the last person rose from his chair and walked forward. It was Dune. His dark eyebrows were drawn together in a frown of concentration. His hands, Lena saw, were clenched into fists at his side. Dune reached into the bag and took out the last scrap of paper. He paused a minute, pressing it tightly in his hand. Go on, said the mayor. Read. Unfolding the paper, Dune read, Messenger. He 
He scowled, crumpled the paper, and dashed it to the floor. <gasps> Lena gasped. The whole class rustled in surprise. Why would anybody be angry to get the job of messenger? <gasps> Bad behavior, cried the mayor. His eyes bulged and his face darkened. Go to your seat immediately. Dune kicked the crumpled paper into the corner. Then he stalked back to his desk and flung himself down. <sighs> the mayor took a short breath and blinked furiously. Uh, uh, disgraceful, he said, glaring at Dune. Childish display of temper. Students should be glad to work for their city. Ember will props prosper if all citizens do their best. He held up a stern finger as he said this and his eyes moved slowly from one face to the next. Suddenly, Dune spoke up. But Ember isn't, is not prospering, he cried. Everything's getting worse and worse. <coughs> Silence, cried the mayor. The blackouts, cried Dune. He jumped up from his seat. The lights go out all the time now and the shortages, well, there's shortages of everything. If no one does anything about it, something terrible is going to happen. Lena listened with a pounding heart. What was wrong with Dune? Why was he so upset? He was taking things too seriously, as he always did. Miss Thorne strode to J Dune and put a hand on his shoulder. Sit down now, she said quietly. But Dune remained standing. The mayor glared. For a few minutes, he said nothing. Then he smiled, showing a neat row of gray teeth. Miss Thorne, he said, who might this young man be? I'm Dune Harrow, said Dune. I will remember you, said the mayor. He gave Dune a long look, then turned to the class and smiled to, his cla to the class again. Or sorry, he turned to the class and smiled his smile again. Congratulations to all, he said. Welcome to Ember's workforce. Miss Thorne, class, thank you. The mayor shook hands with Miss Thorne and departed. The students gathered their coats and caps and filed out of the classroom. Lena walked down the wide hallway with Lizzie, who said, oh, Poor you. I thought I picked a bad one, but you got the worst. Oh, I feel lucky compared to you. Once they were out of the door, Lizzie said goodbye and scurried away, as if Lena's, were, Lena's bad luck were a disease she might catch. Lena stood on the steps for a moment and gazed across Harkin Square, where people walked briskly, bundled up cozily in their coats and scarves, or talked to one another in the pools of light beneath the great street lamps. A boy in a red messenger's jacket ran toward the gathering hall. On Otterwill Street... A man pulled a cart filled with sacks of potatoes, and in the buildings all around the square, rows of lighted windows shone bright yellow and deep gold. Lena sighed. This was where she wanted to be, up here where everything happened, not down underground. Someone tapped her on her shoulder. Startled, she turned and saw Dune behind her. His thin face looked pale. Will you trade with me? he asked. Trade? Trade jobs. I don't want to waste my time being a messenger. I want to help save our city, not run around carrying gossip. Lena gaped at him. You'd rather be in the pipeworks? Electrician's helper is what I wanted, Dean said, but chat won't trade, of course. Pipeworks is second best. But why? <coughs> because the generator's in the pipeworks, said Dune. Lena knew about the generator, of course. In some mysterious way, it turned the running of the river into power for the city. You could feel its deep rumble when you stood in Plummer Square. I need to see the generator, Dune said. I have, I have ideas about it. He thrust his hands into his pocket. So, he said, will you trade? Yes, cried Lena. Messenger is the job that I want most. And it's not a useless job at all, in her opinion. People couldn't be expected to trudge halfway across the city every time they wanted to communicate with someone. Messengers connected everyone to everyone else. Anyway, whether it was an important job or not, 
The job of messenger just happened to be perfect for Lena. She loved to run. She could run forever. And she loved exploring every nook and cranny of the city, which is what a messenger got to do. All right, then, said Dune. He handed her his crumpled piece of paper, which he must have retrieved from the floor. Lena reached into her pocket and pulled out her slip of paper and handed it to him. Thank you, he said. You're welcome, said Lena. Happiness sprang up in her, and happiness always made her want to run. She took the steps three at a time and sped down Broad Street toward home. Now, I challenge you to think about this. I have two things I want you to think about. First of all, go back and find at the, on the map of the city of Ember, I want you to find Otterwill Street. I want you to find the Gathering Hall. And I want you to find Broad Street. Go find those th three things and orient yourself or get acquainted with the city. The next thing I want you to think about is the job of messenger. Why might a city need a job like the messenger? She has to carry messages from one person to another. What type of things might they be missing in the city of Ember that would require them or would cause them to need a messenger? I want you to think deeply about it and we'll talk about it next time. All right, guys, those are the instructions. That's chapter one. It's time to get busy. We'll see you soon and happy reading.